Can you see my screen well? Yes, looks great. Thank you. So my lab at the University of Maryland is interested in understanding human aging. So what is a human aging? Aging reflects all changes that occur over the course of lifespan. According to WHO, the common conditions in older age include a he including hearing loss, the back and the neck pain, and the osteoarthritis that I'm just speaking for myself. But in fact, skin aging is among the most visible part of our aging process. And the, our skin is, if you don't know, the largest organ of our body. Evidence of skin aging includes sagging skin, wrinkles, and other problems. In today's lecture, what I'm going to do is I will first go through what my lab does at the University of Maryland to study human aging. We use a rare genetic disease model to study human aging. Then I will move on to share with you what I have learned during the process and what I have developed for treating skin aging. How and why and how do we age? So based on decades of research, scientists began to understand the human aging process. So there are three major factors involved contributing to our lifespan. The first one is our genes. We have genes associated with longevity. We also have genes associated with disease. And the environment we live in plays a contributing role to how long we live. As you can imagine, if we, there is a highly stressful environment or highly dangerous environment, such as we have been going through in the past couple of years, the global pandemic or the war. So this will be something playing into our lifespan. And the last point is the behavior traits, something like whether you are smoke, drink, exercise, what type of food you take. What our cells do? Our cells constantly receiving the signals from the genes environment and the behavior traits from the inside and outside of the cells. And even from like the food that you taken this morning, then the, our cells react to these informations and send the signals to itself and to other surrounding cells. We call these pathways. These pathways hold the key to understand the human aging process. But how can we study those pathways? <laughs> I'm showing you a cartoon figure here. I really like it, showing you the challenge as an aging researcher. Obviously, studying human aging can be very time consuming. So that's why we scientists have developed model systems. So the common model, I listed a few, but there are many more. Uh, here are like the yeast, a single, nucle a single cell, or worm. Or we can use animal models like mice or even plant. But what my lab does in the University of Maryland is we use a rare genetic disease called progeria. So what's progeria? Progeria, this is a picture actually taken nine years ago in an international progeria workshop. So in the middle, you can see there is a progeria patient and that's my group at that time. Progeria, or you can call it huntington guilford progeria syndrome or in short HGPS is a rare fetal genetic condition of childhood with striking features resembling premature aging. So here is a patient and holding his own pictures at different ages. Children with progeria usually have a quite normal appearance in early infancy, but around the one year to 24 months of age, they started to show affected profound growth delays and result in short stature and low weight. The, the other noticeable phenotypes they have are alopecia 
and diminish the subcutaneous fat. They have severe growth retortation, I already mentioned, and they show severe skeletal abnormalities and usually die, unfortunately, very early in their middle teens due to cardiovascular disease. What do we know about progeria? In 2003, researchers at NIH, Maria Erickson and Francis Collins, they first discovered the major cause, the common cause for progeria accounts for 80% of what we call classical progeria disease. So this is a mutation located in a gene called lamin A or LMNA, which encodes a protein called lamin A. So the gene name is LMNA. So what this mutation does is this mutation, in the presence of the mutation, the, the protein is a little shorter. So it is missing 50 nuclear um, amino acid sequence in the exon 11. So I'm not going to go through the details of what causing the protein uh, uh, mutation, but let's first understand why this simple mutation can cause such a systematic disease. So where is this uh, lamin A protein located? Here showing you a picture of a classical animal cell. In the middle, is the cell nucleus, and the cell nucleus is wrapped around by a double nuclear membrane connected to the endo ER membranes, into plastic reticulum. And inside the nucleus, you cannot see it, but the yellow part is supposed to be the coding, the DNA or our genetic material, our genes. And if you pay attention to this purple bar located right underneath the nuclear membrane, these are called the nuclear laminar. The gene coding progeria is made, the protein lamin A is located in this green, uh, the purple circle, so the purple ring. So what people know about this purple ring so the old time, we think this structure is providing a structural support to the nuclear aminope. So that's actually the first thing we find in progeria patients. So on the, on the left, you see a normal cell with an oval shape. That's what the nucleus is supposed to look like. And in the cell, from the progeria patients in the skin cell from the progeria patients, we found that their nucleus is quite abnormal with these classical blabbings happening inside on, on its nucleus. That's because of the, the, the mutation present in the purple ring of the nuclear lamina that you, provides the support to the nucleus. And uh, here I also included uh, something we call it a uh, Western broad, which is a protein analysis to look at the protein. So in the normal cells, you see there is a white type of lamin A located there. And uh, in the HGPS, HGPS, HGPS is progeria. So you can see there is a slightly shorter form of lamin A, we call it progerin. That's the presence of this toxic protein on the these the nuclear amino and the causing the, the nuclear blabbing phenotype. So the question at that moment was like, is that it? Is that just the structural effect of progerin that's causing this dramatic accelerated disease or there are something else going on? When we zoom in from inside the cell, inside the nucleus, and just a very zoomed picture of showing you this. Imagining here is the nuclear lamina and the mutant protein is located here. So we realize this nuclear lamina is not an 
isolated identity, but it interacts with many other protein factors and membranes and the DNA. For example, here is the basket structure is the doors to connect the nucleus, the inside and the outside, and the nuclear lamina definitely interacts with those. And there are the yellow lines showing you here is our chromat chromosomes and the nuclear lamina is known to bind to the chromosomes. And there are many other proteins floating around the nuclear lamina. So based on the understanding of the cell biology, I proposed a hypothesis about a decade ago when I first started my own laboratory at the University of Maryland. I said progerin cause the effect not only by its structural support to the nucleus, but also by its way it alters the chromatin organizations, maybe also influence transcriptional regular gene transcription. So that was the central hypothesis I had about 10 years ago, but how can we study the aging disease? I probably didn't mention the progeria patients, the number, they are very, it's a very, the progeria is a very rare disease. So worldwide, we only have about over 100 patients and our experimental materials are very limited. Fortunately, we have the access to a small amount of the patient's skin cells from their skin biopsy through the, the, the support from the Progeria Research Foundation. With these materials, we did the initial analysis of the nuclear blabbing. And in 2012, the Nobel Prize was given to two prominent scientists, John Gurdon and Sinia Yamanaka. So what they have found is you can take the skin cell, in this case, from the progeria patients and adding what they call Yamanaka factors are the genes that are highly expressed in fertilized eggs or in the pluripotent cells. And then this overexpression of those genes can reprogram the skin cells into patient-specific induce the pluripotent stem cells. What I say pluripotent seed means, it means they're like fertilized egg. They are not committed to certain cell types. If you give them the right cue, they are able to differentiate into the cell type you want. So with this technology they developed, we use the patient skin cells, reprogram them to the patient specific iPSCs, and then we give them the right signal to ask them to commit to other cell types. Here are some examples of the things we can do. We can ask for liver cells, heart cells, motor neurons, or anything which were unacceptable to us without this technology. With the cell types we would like to study, we will be able to do disease modeling, understand what's going on, and do drug testing. Maybe also in the future, we can do cell replacement therapy. So in the past 10 years, what my lab has been doing is to use the pluripotent stem cells, and we differentiated them into a variety of cell lines I listed here. And because of the patients are dying of cardiovascular disease, so these are the major part we've been focusing on as vascular smooth muscle cells and endothelial cells. The other main areas we've been looking into is the skin aspect. So we differentiate the, the iPSCs into the keratinocytes and the fibroblast. In addition, we also looked into the bone cells and the fat cells. And we published a list of the papers. I'm not gonna to go through each individual one with you, but I would like to share the common, uh, the take home message, what I learned and what I think I should do to follow it up. So what I have learned from all this 10 year study is, my hypothesis, first of all, is correct. So the progerin is doing something, not only the structural supporting, but also it affects some gene expressions and the chromatin organizations. 
and we identify a set of genes that are affected by the presence of progerins. These are the genes play essential roles, at, at least in the cell type we are interested in. Some, for example, PGC1 alpha is a, a gene we identified in a, a deposite differentiation, and it is involved in, in orchestrating the mitochondrial function, so, uh, which is very important for the brown adipocytes or the brown fat cells. And these genes play essential functions in certain cell type, and the changes in them will affect these pathways and lead to the premature aging phenotypes we observed in progeria. So now we have a list of the genes. I didn't list all of them, but we have them. So what will be the next step? So there are three major directions we are going after this right now. The first one is from 2D moving on to 3D, because initially after I differentiated the cells, each individual cell types are separated. For example, the smooth muscle cells and the endothelial cells. Now, because we have multiple cell type, in collaboration with George Chasky's lab at Duke, we started to put in the two different cell types together and make a in vitro vessel. And can actually, the vessels is something inside here, if you can imagine, then we can actually add the, the solutions in to mimic a, a in vitro vessel and look at the vascular function. The, another example is we have two different skin cell types, the keratinocytes and the fibroblast, we will be able to print a, a, a 3D skin model to further study the complex cell-cell interactions and other features in the skin. That's one major direction my lab is pursuing currently. And the second direction is very exciting. So, after the identification of progeria mutation, this is the, the gene structure of lamin A, and the progeria mutation is located here. More and more mutations associated with human disease have been found on the lamin A genes. Here is just a very incomplete list because the paper I got is only from 2006. Now I think there are hundreds of mutations being found in this lamin A gene, causing a variety of different diseases, ranging from muscular dystrophy, cardiomyopathy to lipodystrophy. But most of these diseases are very rare and they are not as well characterized and studied as progeria. So I think the knowledge I have gained in progeria research can be quickly transferred to understand this disease and to help the patients there. And the last part of what my lab is has been doing and is going to continue to do is to find the treatment for progeria. Here I listed the progress in the progeria field. The gene was identified in 2003, and we actually launched the first clinical trial in 2007 using farnesyl transferase inhibitor. The clinical trial was wrapped up in 2011, and what we have found is it is a helpful treatment. So it increased the patient's body weight, reduced the vascular stiffness, increased the bone mineral density and extended the lifespan by 1.6 years, but it didn't provide a final cure. The ongoing clinical trial is based on one of my research papers in 2011. So the, the drug they use is Everonimers and the this is a rapamycin analog, which uh, it does is to, to inhibit the major pathway inside the cell, as well as stimulate cell clearance pathway. And we do not have the results there yet, but this again is not a specific treatment to progeria, but basically we are changing some type cell conditions to help the to cells to 
to tolerate or to clear the toxic protein progerin out of the, body, the patient's body. And the last year, in collaboration with Francis Collins lab at NIH and David Luce lab at uh, Harvard, we published the two papers aiming to do the gene therapy for progeria. So these two papers, we were, we described that we can actually do gene editing or use the antisense morphine loads to change the, the gene sequence or splicing in the animals, uh, progeria animal models. And if we do that, we can see there is a significant improvement of the phenotype. This will be the future of progeria treatment. But today, what I am here is to tell you there is another interesting treatment for maybe not progeria patients, but also for everyone, including you and I, which we call methylene blue. So what is methylene blue? So methylene blue is considered the first fully synthetic drug used in medicine. It was first synthesized in 1876 as a dye, laboratory dye, then was used as a treatment for malaria. Methylene blue has a chemical structure showing you here, and it is, has some very interesting properties. So it is an antioxidant. The reason it is an antioxidant is it can be oxidized or reduced and the, its redox potential, very interestingly, is very close to the endogenous antioxidants we have in our body. And the, methane, the oxidized form of methane blue is blue color. And when it gets reduced, it becomes colorless, and we call it a local methane blue. When methane blue is oxidized, it is water soluble. And when it is reduced, it's lipid soluble because it can switch back and forth so easily inside the cells. So methylene blue has this interesting property of both lipid solubility and water solubility. So it can enter the cell membrane easily and transport it inside the, the cytosol easily and enter the comp cellular compartments easily. Methylene blue also is an FDA approved drug it has been used in clinics even to treat the Alzheimer's disease as a neuron protective reagent. And it is also on the WHO's list as, a safe and essential, uh, as one of the safe and essential medicine. You probably are like, wait, I heard about a methylene blue. Yes, you do. You probably have seen this in a pet store or on Amazon. Yes, methylene blue has been used as an aquarium safe disinfectant. And we do have a clinical form of methylene blue solution, which is an injectable FDA approved solution for patient usage. So why did we start here to study methylene blue? This has to come from mitochondria. Mitochondria is the ATP production factory in the cell. As you can see in this cell diagram, the mitochondria is showing you here in these orange beans. And the mitochondria dysfunction, for example, mutations in mitochondria or mitochondria dysfunction are connected closely to human aging. So in 2016, a scientist in my lab started to look into the mitochondria in progeria cells. And by a quick standing, she found that they look very different from our, we call control or the normal healthy skin cells. In the normal healthy skin cells, the mitochondria looks like a rod or a fiber like very long. And in progeria, it becomes swollen and fragmented. Then she did a high resolution transmission electron microscopy to further review the defects in mitochondria. I'm not going to 
these are just a few examples of how bad those mitochondria look, appear in progeria cells. So they are they have branch and they have they have some broken mitochondria and some of them are just the dead ghost mitochondria here and there. So the question I asked at that time was, can we actually use some mitochondria drug to help the mitochondria in progeria cells? If we do that, can we actually help the progeria cells? So if that's the case, the, the mitochondria drug maybe can be translated into a treatment for progeria. That was the thinking behind the methylene blue story. So why we look at methylene blue? So we look at this double membrane, that's mitochondrial membrane. So as I mentioned, mitochondria is our energy production factory inside the cell. So the mitochondria has a double membrane at the outer membrane and the inner membrane. On the inner membrane, there is a protein factory, four protein factors, one, two, three, four. They use to pump the protons to the intermembrane space while releasing the, the electrons to the mitochondria matrix, basically is the inside of the mitochondria. And these protons come together and form a gradient going through the ATP synthesis to drive to make the energy protein, uh, energy ATP there. So, but the side of product of the mitochondria one, it produces the ATP is the electrons. The electron can be rescued by cytochrome C and other protein factors and natural antioxidant in the cell. But if it bound to the oxygen, it become a reactive oxygen species or ROS. You are going to hear it again, again in my talk from now on. So ROS is bad for our cells. It can oxidize our DNA make mutations, oxidize our protein and make protein aggregates and destroy protein function. And it is also the problem cause our skin to age. Because of uh, based on our understanding of methylene blue, we know methylene blue can enter the mitochondrial membranes and it has a redox potential close to the endogenous antioxidant. Methylene blue actually can effectively capture the, the free electrons released during the ATP production and release it when it is needed. When we added the methylene blue to progeria cells and also to normal cells, what we have found is there is a significant reduction of ROS in both scenarios. And the ATP production is upregulated also in these cells means the mitochondria are happier. So the end story of that study is, we found the methylene blue is a very helpful, very helpful reagent to promote mitochondrial health in both normal and in progeria cells. It can re help to reduce the ROS and it can also promote ATP production. Which I didn't tell you is we also found methane blue in the nucleus because it can enter nucleus easily to help to improve progeria phenotype. So we mentioned the ROS a number of times now. What are ROS? They are, again, they are reactive oxygen species. These are the highly re reactive charged form of oxygen. And it does so many damages to our cells. But where does it, do they come from? So naturally, for based on our metabolic activities, we generate about the 10% of the ROS in our skin cells. And the, the, from the externally, especially from UV radiation, the, 80 to 90% of the ROS are coming from that. And how does ROS age our skin? So the ROS comes in damage, as I mentioned, inside the cells, oxidize the DNA, 
and oxidize the protein inside the cell. And also it does damage to the surrounding structures of our skin structure, especially in this case, I'm showing you here is the collagen. So it will break down the collagen fibers. The result of too much ROS is age spot, loosened skin and wrinkles. So ROS is one of the most significant factors causing skin aging. So because of my discovery on methylene blue, beneficial effect in both progeria and normal cells. So in 2017, a year after I published the paper of the mitochondria paper, my lab used a 3D skin tissue from the normal donors and tested the methane blues result on a 3D normal skin. So this is the, the published paper and I have published many, many papers in my career. I have to admit that this is one of the papers which I didn't put down too much effort but got me so much attention, not only from the, the scientific world but also from the consumer side. Days after the publication, my lab has received numerous phone calls from, from people everywhere worldwide asking me for, do you have a methylene blue based cream? And uh, this paper not only was ranked the top 100 by the scientific journals, but also it was highlighted in the consumer side by the journals like Allure and other journals. So what did we find in report in that paper that got so much interest? So let's look at how methylene blue can help fight skin aging. So the common problem we have with our skin, the first one during the aging process is the sagging skin. The reason of the sagging skin is the decrease of the skin protein fibers, for example, collagen or elastin. In our study, we have found methylene blue can stimulate both collagen and elastin production. So in this figure shows you the after two weeks methylene blue treatment, we see a doubling of the elastin production. And here is actually the data for collagen. On the other side, we also see a decrease of a matrix metalloprotease showing you here is MMPs. These are the proteases that come in cleave our collagen and elastin. And in the treatment with methylene blue, this protease expression is suppressed. Second common problem we have with our aged skin is a dry and dehydrated skin. The cause of it is a decrease of lipid production. The lipid are the essential fatty acids that give us the glowing, useful look of our skin. What we found in the paper is methylene blue is able to stimulate the production of a key protein factor, PGC1-alpha, I told you a little earlier as well. So this is a central regula regulator for lipid biogenesis. This is again a, a graph showing you in the normal and also in progeria cases. After methylene blue treatment in blue bars, we see a significant upregulation of PGC1 alpha in both cases. And the third problem I see with the, the aged skin is rough and irritable skins. This usually is caused by the skin turnover rate slows down as we age. And what we have found in our solution is methylene blue can help skin proliferation. So here, again, the blue lines are the methylene blue treated cells. The solid line is normal and the dashed line is progeria. And the, 
we in this experiment, we also had uh, another antioxidant, NAC, as a control. So not all the antioxidants can do magic as methylene blue. And in our case, on the four weeks of treatment, methylene blue clearly showing a beneficial effect to promote skin proliferation. In addition to that, we did a very interesting experiment to use a scraper we call to, to create an artificial wound on the cell culture dish. That's what we call zero hours. So basically we grow the cells and we create a wound. Then in 24 hours, what we are looking for is to see the surrounding cells can actually move in and to heal the wound. And we did it under the condition of mock treatment or the methylene blue treatment. And we did it in a middle-aged fibroblast from a, a donor in around 40 years old and also from a donor over 80 years old. So what did we find in this experiment? We found that yes, the wound healing ability is definitely decreased with age. So middle age is doing better than the older age. But after methylene blue treatment, in both cases, they are increased. So the middle age is improved and so does the old age fibroblast. And another problem we often encounter with our skin is the thinning of our skin. As we age, our skin gets thinner and thinner. This is usually the cause of, the cause of it is the overall skin fitness. What we have found in our study use a 3D skin model is, after we treat the methylene blue of the skin, we see a increase of the skin dermis with the treatment, especially at the 0.5 micromolar. So by here, I have told you a few beneficial effects we have observed of methylene blue on treating the skin problems usually related to the aging, such as sagging skins, thinning skins, irritable skins, et cetera. But you probably is going to ask me, Dr. Cao, as you just said, so the ROS is a culprit causing all the skin problems. And 90% of the ROS are actually not from the aging, but from the environment, from the UVs, from the sunshines. So how can we do that? Yes, that's how about a sunscreen, right? So if we look at the, the visible light and the UVs, so this is a range over 400 nanometer as a range we can see. Then below that is the ultraviolet light. It is separated, uh, separated into two parts, the UVA and the UVB. UVA waves are longer in wavelengths. They are 400 to 320 nanometer in wavelengths and they penetrates deeper into our skin, reach the dermis of our skin, which generating high levels of ROS and causing photoaging. And the UVBs are shorter in wavelengths, 290 to 320 nanometer, and, but they carry a much higher energy. They can cause sunburns, DNA damage mutations in our skin, and which may even lead to skin cancer. So these are the two types of the UVs our skin are dealing with it daily. And but what is the problem of the current sunscreens? The current sunscreens has two main deficiencies. The first one is lack of UVA protection because the sunscreens are approved by FDA on the basis of their ability to prevent sunburns as measured by a standardized factor called SPF or sun protection factor. But if SPF does not measure the protection from UVA, 
but just the UVB. So we do not know an SPF 50 sunscreen can actually help with a photo agent. No, we have no idea. And the second is our current sunscreen has a very common active ingredient, which is called oxybenzone. Oxybenzone has been shown to be very toxic to coral reefs. You probably are like, what? Coral reefs? And why do we care about the coral reefs? Coral reefs are some of the most diverse and variable ecosystems on Earth. Coral reefs support more species per unit per area than any other marine environment. Coral reef supports about 4,000 species of fish, 800 species of card corals, and hundreds of other species. Here, I'm, I'm showing you a video with no scientific merit, but it's just a fun video we took in the coral farm I have at the University of Maryland. This is a species of co soft coral called Xenia. So what you just saw is the Xenia is happy. It's doing something classical. It does, it's called pausing. Because coral reefs supports so much diversity and also the coral reef is considered the rainforest of the ocean because of it, the coral skeletons like trees contain potentially long-term record of the climate. So the corals not only support the biodiversity of the sea, it also record all the climate change over the times. And the, the Let's see it again because I really love this video. It's so relaxing to see the coral, happy corals. The coral has a very interesting color here. The color is the purplish. What does the color come from? The color of the corals are actually determined by the algae living inside its polyp, or you can consider the fingers of the corals. The algae and the coral, they depend on each other and they form a symbiotic relationship. Their survival, so if we, their survival is dependent on each other, but if the coral is stressed, for example, the temperature change or the harsh chemicals or pollution, so the algae will leave the coral or the coral will push the algae out. And the coral will be left without, without the algae color. So it is what you call coral bleaching. Or the, the bleach, the coral is very vulnerable and usually die very fast. So what I have learned by ha having a coral farm in my own lab is this coral bleaching happens very fast, usually within days to weeks. And the replenish of the coral species takes a much longer time and much harder to do. Study have shown from 1995 to 2017, the coral population had dropped by more than 50, 50%. And the coral reef associated biodiversity has dropped by 63%. So in fact, there, there are some ban on the beach locations to, to ban the sunscreen with oxybenzone, which I already mentioned is harmful for the coral reefs. Based on our knowledge of methylene blue as an effective ROS scavenger, and also a quarium safe reagent, and its function in mediating DNA damage repair, and that I didn't talk about it. So I hypothesize maybe methylene blue has the potential to replace oxybenzone as a coral safe 
active ingredient in sunscreen. So we did some research in the laboratory, and I'm not, I don't have time to show you all the results here, but I just want to show you the, the take home messages based on our research. Methylene blue, we found, shows a broad spectrum absorption, both UVA and UVB. And in, in the range of UVB, it is comparable to oxybenzone, if not better. As I already told you, methylene blue is a robust raw scavenger, a potent antioxidant. So it can effectively combat photoaging caused by UVA. And most importantly, coral is not toxic to coral reef. Uh, methylene blue is not toxic to coral reef. And this is the study I would like to show you. We did it in the, in the coral farm we had in the lab. So we, we put the, cor the soft coral zemia in separate rooms and separate bags. And we treat the, the, the corals with two dosing of either methylene blue or oxybenzone. And the control is without the treatment and the DMSO is just a solvent for methylene blue and the, the oxybenzone. So what you can see is that that's a zero day treatment, day one, day three, and the day seven. And by the seventh day, the oxybenzone treated the coral already dead, but the methylene blue didn't do any harm to the corals. So this study was again published in Nature Scientific Report last year and made another big stir in the field. So I guess at this point, you may ask, we are running out of time. Last problem is, is there a methylene blue based facial cream available? So as Annie has introduced, my lab at UMD was the first to file the patents on the use of methylene blue to treat aging human skin. And I formed a UMD startup company, M Blue Labs, in 2018. And our brand is called Blue Link. And this is a, a picture showing you some of the products we have on Blue, Link, we, on Blue Link website. We have about 10 different SKUs now. And this is our most recent launch, the Blue Link Blue Vado Sunfix. And in this Sunfix is a coral reef Sunfix. We have the methylene blue added in the, in the as together with the minerals. So I would like to thank you for your attention for that. So I generated a special promo code UMD22 here. So if you use that on the ruling site, you will get a dramatic discount of 22% on all everything there. So I would like to use the last couple of minutes to thank the people who did the work. So these are my collaborators over the past 10 years, and that's my lab. And this lady in the middle did most of the methylene blue studies. And our funding agencies are from NIH, Edison Foundation, Progeria Research Foundations, and the Marin Stem Cells. I also would like to thank my, my company site. So I founded M Blue Labs in 2018, and it has been doing really well in the past four and a half years. And uh, I'm, I'm so thankful to my best friend and my CEO, Ms. Jasmine L. Cody. And uh, we worked together, together so well, and uh, our, our advisor and our help from John and our funding agencies. Now I'm ready to take questions. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tao, for that um, really in-depth explanation, really going from, you know, the beginning of, of the why all the way to, um, you know, now Blue Lane. 
Um, one of the questions, I'll give folks a, a second to just get their questions in the chat. So feel free to put all your questions in the chat. Hopefully we can get to a couple. Um, but the first one I have for you really is around kind of the last point you made about um, how you and your lab were the first to patent that type of sunscreen. Um, do you have any people who are knocking on your door trying to do the same thing that are saying, oh, well, you know, of course, if all signs lead towards needing, you know, this type of sunscreen or lotion, um, you know, who, who's, who's trying to also get into this field or because of the patent, are you allowed to, you know, really kind of stay in your own lane? Yeah, so the, uh, this is a very a critical question, right? So the, the patent protects us the absolute usage of methylene blue on human skin. And we have the US patent already. So anybody wants to put a methylene blue in lotion, you know, they, they'll probably have to come to talk to us to get a license, talk to the university, the OTC. And we are in the process of getting the patent from the Europe. European area, yeah. Oh, interesting, okay. Well, let me jump to these questions because we got a couple in the chat. Um, so the first one we have from David um, is, are there independent studies that verify your results? Yes, there are. So for the for the studies, there are independent scientific studies showing methylene blue has beneficial results. And we also had a, a independent clinical trial to apply methylene blue lotion we generated on, I think, 42 women. And uh, they picked the woman, they did the analysis. And uh, so the result is showing 91% showing overall improvement after a month of usage. So we have that result published on our website. Then they had different categories like wrinkles, like pigmentations and stuff like that. So great. Um, next question is around um, vitamin D absorption. How does the methane blue in sunscreen affect that absorption, if, if any, if it has any effect at all? So that's an excellent question. So we know vitamin D is important and it is actually stimulated by sunshine. So something with a physical sunscreen is it actually blocks the vitamin D absorption. But the methylene blue, if it if eventually gets approved to be a, an active as a sunscreen active, so it will not interfere with vitamin D absorption because it's a chemical some blocker. Great, that's very helpful. Okay, let's see. I'm trying to I'm trying to go through these quickly. So, um, someone had a question around. Um, Melissa had a question about a skin regimen. I'm sure many folks come to you wondering, what should I do at this age or with this type of skin? But um, someone, Melissa was asking. So, a 50 year old with fair freckled skin, do you have specific products that you recommend? Ah, uh, I only can talk about the, the products because I, in the past four years, uh, brewing is the only stuff I use. I cannot comment on other brand just because of that. So I would recommend maybe starting with our samples of the Night Plus. So that would be, we have a, a smaller size sample. So. That's good to know. I like the sample size so you can try things out. That's helpful. Um, another question came in, in one of the um, methylene blue examples, there was an injectable form. Is that available or something more potent than, than creams? So I would not recommend anyone to just apply methylene blue themselves. First, if you do not use the right concentration, you will stain yourself blue. <laughs> then you will be L. So we, uh, it, what in the lab we did is we actually optimize the maximum benefit, but it doesn't actually give you a color. So the injectable form is for internal like medical use. So we do use a farm grade methylene blue in our products, but we do not support people just to take medicine blue themselves. It's good to know. We don't want to turn anyone, uh, turn anyone blue. <laughs> um, we had a question from Rebecca. Um, 
How does the methylene blue compare to other non-oxybenzone-based sunscreens, like those with zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so I, I, this I have to comment on the U.S. market because the FDA on the list, there are more of those, these zinc oxide, titanium dioxides are considered physical blockers. So they are safe for coral reefs and they are usually safe for human too. But uh, FDA has, uh, in, in Japanese, I see Japanese chemical sunscreen. I know there are additional yeah. chemicals there, but um, uh, it's not approved in US by FDA. So methylene blue currently is not approved by FDA yet because FDA has not opened up the, the monogram for, for approval for, for sunscreen actives. So the sunscreen we recently launched actually has a concentration of zinc oxide and titanium oxide in uh, together with methylene blue so you can see if you apply it and uh, this is more on the side of a, a moisturizer and a sunscreen so basically you you will have multiple anti-aging effects as well as sun blocking effects rendered from zinc oxide titanium oxide together with methylene blue Mm, okay, that's that's helpful. And this question will sadly be our last, but I think it goes right into this. So, are you marketing um, your products as a cosmetic, as a potentially FDA regulated product, or um, sunscreen, or, or an approved drug? What's what's kind of the the marketing there for you? So it's a consumer product. It's in the category of skincare. So and so we. Skin yeah, it's a yeah. skincare. So, and the 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 sunscreen we launched is a OTC. So we have a couple of items. Those are the OTC products. One is the hand sanitizer, which is I didn't talk about. Methylene blue has this antibacterial, antifungal function. So we we launched a hand sanitizer with also seventy percent ethanol. And uh, people like it because it moisturizes their skin, you know, hand sanitizer can dry your skin. And uh, we also have the sunscreen, which we also included the actives approved by FDA, the zinc oxide and the titanium oxide. Uh, well, that's, ex that's so exciting. And um, I'm sad we have to wrap up. We got a lot of great questions. So thanks to the audience who, who are so interested. And the last question I'll just say was one um, about the discount code. So the discount code is capital UMD22, I'll put it in the chat. Um, and Dr. Chow said it was better than their Black Friday deals. So make sure you go check onto their website and, and learn about the, the great products now that we know all the wonderful research that she's she and her team have done. So a huge thank you to you for sharing all of your wisdom and your expertise today. Um, I will send a follow-up to all those who participated with some information about how you can keep in touch and um, follow the great work that Dr. Tao is doing. So um, look out for that email, but just again, a huge kind of round of applause. I think hopefully you can see in the, in the chat, Dr. Tao, that, you know, folks are so grateful for all that you shared. So a huge thank you to you. Um, and thanks to all of our Terps who, who tuned in today. We have one more faculty series taking place next week. So we hope you can join us for that. So any parting words on your end before we close out? Well, I thank everybody for your attention and the uh... Enjoy. Uh, stay young. <laughs> Just stay young. That's a great way to end. Go Terps and stay young. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.